There is nothing to justify the systematic, widespread brutality that is inflicted on your own brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. And therefore, for you to be able to influence that, to say, stop, you cannot defer it until the land is demarcated. You can't defer it until A or B or C because authoritarian governments are very good at creating new facts on the ground to get you to defer your decision, to say, okay, I'll wait until this is done. Where is the rule of law in Eritrea? The rule of law must be paramount in any country. The government and its agents must be subject to the law. People who have their rights abused must have an avenue to raise their grievances. And when they do, they should not be arrested and thrown into prison. Rather, they should be heard by a properly constituted independent court, which is staffed by professional judges who are also not frightened of being arrested. So long as there is no constitution, so long as there is no parliament where you can debate national questions, so long as there is an abusive national service which is unending, so long as there is no free press, so long as there are no civil society organisations apart from government appointed ones, so long as people live in fear and are controlled by the state, there will be no full enjoyment of all human rights and no real progress for the Eritrean people. The preamble of the ICC statute states that crimes that shock the conscience of humanity, such as those that we have documented in our report, threaten the peace, security and well-being of the world and therefore must not go unpunished. We need collectively to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice, not only for the sake of the countless number of Eritrean victims, but to demonstrate that such behaviour is simply unacceptable anywhere in the world today. Good morning, Salah Yunus. I just wanted to first start with saying thank you for taking the time to answer some questions this morning. You need little introduction as you've been an advocate for human rights in Eritrea for a long time and a respected activist. I'll go straight into the main reason for this conversation today. On June 8th, 2016, last week, the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in Eritrea released its second report. The first report was released about 12 months ago. The first report documented numerous human rights violations in Eritrea, and the commission was then tasked to determine which of these human rights violations amount to crimes against humanity. To start with the most basic question many people have, what kind of crimes are considered crimes against humanity, or when does a crime rise to be a crime against humanity? Sure. Good morning. And uh, thank you for having me. I should preface by saying I'm not a lawyer. And uh, my understanding of what I'm going to say is no more than a close reading and following this uh, issue for a long time. So people should take it with that uh, caveat. So uh, Crimes Against Humanity is based on the uh, Rome Statute, which was signed in uh, June 1998, which ironically is right about the time the Eritrea-Ethiopia conflict was ignited. So it had been in discussions for three years following the Rwanda genocide. It was accelerated following the civil war in Yugoslavia. So right there, it tells you it was written to protect civilians from extreme excesses of armed men. As you can see from the specifics, they deal with essentially murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, imprisonment, and severe deprivation of physical liberty, torture, rape, sexual slavery, persecution of uh, an identifiable group, enforced disappearance, apartheid, and other inhumane acts of similar character intentionally causing great suffering. So I'm reading it from the uh, Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. So the emphasis here is all these crimes, when they happen in a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. 
And so what the discussion is going to be going forward is, was it widespread? Was it systematic? Was it directed against civilian populations? In other words, are the national service conscripts civilians or military? And did the government have full knowledge of what it was doing or were they random acts? Those are what we're going to discuss, I, I presume, over the next, or, the, or I should say not us, the uh, lawyers for the government of Eritrea and the international community. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's very clear where the uh, Commission of Inquiry stands on this matter. They, you know, Their second report is 92 pages, unlike the first one, which was 500. And in this specific case, their mandate was, okay, we get your report. Could you please find out if crimes against humanity were committed? And they're saying emphatically, yes. And here is our rationale for it. And they go into settled law and they go into great definition of what is widespread, what is systematic. And, uh, you know, a surprising answer to, what, to whether national service members are military or civilians. So, in essence, to answer your question, that is the basis for the uh, crimes against humanity. If you can simplify and explain in layman terms what these actions or decisions taken by the UN Commission of Inquiry on Eritrea, what, do, what does it mean? What does it really mean when they make such a statement? Sure. Well, that's, that's one of the many problems in our country because we wasted the last 25 years without building political and legal institutions to close even our law school. We don't have even the vocabulary for it. I can come up with a metaphor. The closest example I can give is that of the of a grand jury or a preliminary hearing in the mm -hmm. West. In those cases, there's only a prosecutor and a judge and a jury. In some cases, there's not even a judge. It's just the prosecutor and a jury. And the prosecutor makes the case to the jury. If they determine that there is probable cause, that is, if there's enough evidence, then they recommend that it, it goes to a full trial where the accused is indicted and has an opportunity to hire a lawyer, gather their own witnesses, defend themselves in a court of law. To me, that's what the, exactly what the Commission of Inquiry convened, a preliminary hearing, they got witnesses. From the witness testimonies, they were convinced that there is probable cause for indictment, and now they want to refer it to a competent court, whether that is the ICC or uh, some other uh, African variations of it or some other what they call a national court. But they're convinced the government of Eritrea does not have the political will nor the ability to conduct these uh, hearings the way they should be done by a competent court. So basically the findings of the commission determined that there is enough evidence to go to a trial and that, uh, like you said, it will be determined where that court could be. And you mentioned the ICC, which is the international criminal court, or it may be another legal body, but basically right. this report is saying, yes, there is enough evidence to go forward. To right. Okay. Right. So I think the term they use uh, in the United States, at least, is that the jury, which would be the witnesses, mm -hmm. return with an indictment. They said, yeah, there's enough evidence for you here to go forward. And, uh, and uh, what the commission is saying, yeah, there's enough evidence for you, which is the international community, the UN, the Human Rights Council, to go forward and to try them in a competent court. And how would you describe the response from the Eritrean government to the decisions of the Commission of the Inquiry on Eritrea? The, the government, the Eritrean government's first reaction to everything is categorical denial and nitpicking. Ideologically, should we say, from their perspective, which is shared by many authoritarian governments, including China, there should be no country-specific inquiry. All nations, small and mighty, should be subjected to the universal periodic review where they hear recommendations. And then they adopt they, what they like, they reject what they don't like, and the process goes on indefinitely. So they argue that the right way is the universal periodic review. But what they forget, or they choose to forget, is that the Commission of Inquiry itself and the special rapporteurs them, uh, are actually a result of the Human Rights Council being frustrated since 2003, that's, you know, over a decade, of just trying to get them to take baby steps 
through the universal periodic review, and they not making enough progress to the point where the Human Rights Council said, okay, we'll accelerate this, we'll name a special rapporteur, and when the, whatever the special rapporteur tells us, that will make us decide whether we want to name a commission of inquiry. The Ministry of Information tried to complain about the right of the Commission of Inquiry to hold a press conference, but as I've written, this is what all commissions of inquiries do. They did it with when they were investigating North Korea, Syria, Gaza. Mm -hmm. So I guess they gave up after that, so they sent uh, Yamana Gabra up, who, is, who incidentally does not even hold a government post. He's a party executive to speak on behalf of the permanent mission. I don't think Yamana Gabrab helped his case. I mean, we don't have time to go into all the details, but just two examples that show you that the government is frozen in some Nafa bunker and has not really read how to win friends and influence people. When he was asked about rape in Eritrea, he said that the number of rapes in Eritrea can be counted in two fingers. Uh, he meant in two hands, so oh ten. And in doing that, he's adding insults to the injuries of the victims. Then he said, it's not in our culture, implying, as the journalist who challenged him stated, that I guess in some other cultures, rape is condoned. And then there was his categorical dismissal of the shoot-to-kill policy where he challenged the world to show a single case. Oh, a single case? I mean, the children of Petro Salomon testified that they were shot at. And, of course, speaker of Petro Solomon, he gave some meaningless answer when he was asked about the G15, the journalists included Dawit Dawidisha. I mean, remember, shortly after they arrested the G15, they were talking that they, are, they can't speak about it because they had confederates out there still conspiring. And they're still making that argument. Anyway, to answer your question, their defense is going to be to persuade enough members of the Human Rights Council and the Security Council that there was no large-scale crime, and even if there was, it doesn't account to crimes against humanity. So that's, that's you, you mentioned what cards they have to play. That's really the only one they can at this time, to say the crimes may have happened, but they're random, and they definitely don't rise to crimes against humanity, and I suspect they will have very competent lawyers to argue that case. What are the steps that the different UN bodies will take after these findings, the possible different scenarios that could be the outcome of this report. Who do you think would support those findings and who would be against them? Lobbying on behalf of the, to say that it's not sure. systematic and it's not widespread. Right. What are the possible different scenarios? Different scenarios. Well, uh, it's a mental exercise, but you can analyze the 50 members of the Human Rights Council and place them in like four categories. And these four categories to me are yes, leaning yes, leaning no, and no. Mm -hmm. So I would leave that to political scientists who do this for a living. From a layman's perspective, from my perspective, at this time, it's no better than a 50-50 chance. And there's a combination of two things that are make me say that. First, there's Europe sheer exhaustion in dealing with Eritrean migrants and the Eritrean government's strong charm offensive that may persuade some European countries to either vote no or vote yes in a pro forma way and then do nothing to advance the vote. Of course, Africa block. So, you know, the uh, Human Rights Council has blocks. There's the Africa block. There's the South American block. There's the Asian block. There's the Western Europe. And then there's the Eastern Europe block. So by and large, Africa, and by Africa, of course, we mean the ruling elite of Africa, because <laughs> certainly we don't have many elected governments in Africa. But the ruling elite of Africa, have their contempt for the ICC is well known. And the, the Gulf Arab nations, which a significant number of them make up the Asia bloc, they have made their deal in, in exchange for Eritrea joining the coalition. And then there are always the reliables, which is China, Russia, Cuba, and so on who are, are basically like a block against the Commission of Inquiry recommending this to go forward. So that's at the, the state level, at the government level. At the peripheries, which is the scholars and the think tanks and the activists of, of who's against it, in general, uh, left-leaning scholars and journalists are very accommodating of the excesses of, of 
politicians who share their their worldview. There's a long and not illustrious record of Western intellectuals and journalists who were enamored with Mao, Stalin, Castro, the most the most famous one being the case of uh, George Bernard Shaw, who defended Stalin's mass killings. We see the same of that in Eritrea now. So to me, the Bhutans, the Harpers, the Tanya Mullers, are the Shaw to the, the George Bernard Shaw without his writing skills, to Eritrea okay. Stalin. And what they're doing now will be a dark spot in their careers, I believe. But that's how I see it right now. So 50-50 for people in their own self-interest voting to block the move, not because they don't believe the testimonies of the witnesses, but it's just not in their self-interest to do that. What do you think would be the impact of the relationship of the Eritrean government and the people, especially the youth, of, when it comes to these findings? Do you think it would have an impact on the inside of the country? And mm. what about on government officials? There may be no particular names identified in this particular report, but obviously there's some implication of government involvement and higher uh, government officials' involvement in, in the systematic abuse. Do you think that that could cause some internal conflict? Sure. Well, that's, that's really an, an, an excellent question. And the short answer is, I don't know. So, but you're not interviewing me, so I can say I don't know. So I'll just take a stab at it. So uh, there's a call here for us to be humble because as we learn from the Forto incident, and the conscripts uprising in downtown Asmara earlier this year, and the reaction of the people to demolishing of their homes in Adaiyah a couple of years ago, it's really hard to predict how commanders or anyone in Eritrea will react, and what exactly and who exactly will trigger the reaction. In general, we can say that the president has a long history of folding when he's cornered. This happened when Ethiopia regained Badame in 1999. It happened with his policy in Somalia after he got Eritrea sanctioned. It happened with his diplomatic shuttle to Uganda after he had gotten Eritrea sanctioned. It happened with his invitation to Emirates, to Asab, and joining the Saudi coalition after he said that would never happen. It happened with his decision to acknowledge he had Djibouti prisoners of war after years of denial. And it happens every two years so whenever they are revising Eritrea's uh, macroeconomic policy. As to what, how this will impact the high-ranking military officers, well, that's, that's really a two-part question, a two-parter to me. First, the arm of the ICC is not as long as, as the one that the Eritrean revolution used to claim it had. I mean, the ICC's arms are fairly short. If the accused stay at home, they are not in danger. They are only in danger if they leave the country. And so for people who have decided that they're going to go down with the ship, then the danger of being scooped up by the ICC for being a criminal is far less than the danger of being scooped up, scooped up by the uh, National Eritrean Security government. Office of Eritrea <laughs> for oh being too goodness. independent and discovering a conscience. If you actually read the, the commission's report, the government can go to anyone who is about to discover they have a conscience and tell them it's too late because the, the ICC really can interpret who is guilty and who is not very liberally. I mean, it, 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 is, a, it is a chain of command. So if you had even a role, not just in executing the order, but if you had a role in instigating it, if any role that you had, be used against you in this crimes against humanity. So the, the, the government can very well go to the commanders and say, uh, it's too late to uh, find you have a conscience yeah. now. There are many different arguments, of course, about the, there are many perspectives about the International Criminal Court, often, especially African countries, people from Africa, scholars, everything, have, you know, feel like that the ICC targets Africans, that it's one of the new colonial actors in the international affairs, that there's a focus on strong men, dictators from, from Africa. How do you envision the Eritrean opposition groups or opposition in general counteract arguments that these findings in Eritrea, because that's what the government is going to say, that this is just another example of Western, the West imposing its 
its will on African nations, that it's politically mo- motivated. How do Eritrean opposition counteract the, that sure. argument? Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, uh, Yamane Gabrap in his uh, Q&A did already attempt that, that this is not just an attack against Eritrea, it's, a, it's an attack against Africa and all developing nations. So he's, he's going even beyond Africa. To me, to say that the ICC targets African countries exclusively is like saying European aid is focused on Africa or that the lowest developed nations are almost all Africans. I mean, these are not unrelated. So beyond that, let's take a look at the at those who have been indicted by the ICC. So my question is, who is it on the list that you feel was wrongly indicted? You know, Kony? Omar al-Bashir, Jean pierre Bimba, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Lauren Gbagbo. I mean, who is it that you say, oh, my God, they, they really wronged that guy. He didn't deserve to be uh, on the ICC indictment list. Uh, do I think that the ICC sometimes overreaches simply because the victims of the crimes are either UN or AU peacekeepers? I do. Does it sometimes, as in the case of Uhuru, Kenyatta, does it? move too fast and should it have let the Kenyan courts deal with the abuses? I do. But what the what the Commission of Inquiry is saying is there is zero mechanism and zero political power, political will in Eritrea to try these people in an Eritrean court of law. Mm-hmm. So, so then what? Well, that's exactly why institutions like the ICC were set up. My personal preference is that, you know, uh, uh, the AU, the African Union, take that up and not the ICC for reasons that he just stated, because people have a natural reaction of, okay, here they go again, the the neo-colonials going after an independent African. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, you don't want to be in the company of of, of those that have been indicted. I can't think of any one of them Maybe with the exception of Uhuru Kenyatta, where I would say, ah, I think they, they overreach on this one. A, a lot of the people on the list are uh, actually not even state actors. They are uh, rebel leaders and so Now, to go back, I think you mentioned the opposition. Why some are reluctant is because we believe that the U.S. and the U.N. did us wrong in the 1940s. And if the argument is if they were wrong, then they must be wrong now. And the second thing is that their agenda, which is the 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 ICC, the I'm sorry, the Commission of Inquiries agenda or the Human Rights Council's agenda, may overlap with ours, but it's not identical. For example, I remember in one of the Universal Periodic Reviews, Italy recommended that Eritrea recognize the right of the transgender people. Well, you and I know where that is in the priority list of Eritreans. So part of the pushback from Eritreans is that, okay, this may be your agenda, but it's not our agenda, but mm-hmm. not when it comes to what is focused on here, which is torture, uh, enforced disappearance, and, uh, and enslavement, then right. uh, nobody is for that. And this kind of goes to another, leads into another question. You know, one of the observations in Eritrean politics is that usually the government reaches out, or at least uh, creates all these phantom enemies. Everybody is out to get Eritrea. They really push that propaganda, that viewpoint where that there are all these different people who are after Eritrea, and that creates this really deep national loyalty that if you're being attacked, then you must right. defend, regardless of what is going on. Do you see the government doubling down on that? In the situation. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, I, it, it's not just the Eritrean government. Any government would do that, which I think is called in, in political science the rallying around the flag effect. So in this right. case, they're not just rallying around the Eritrean flag. They're, ra- they're going to rally around the Pan-African flag, which they just discovered they're part of Africa. They're going to rally around the developing nations flag. So I fully expect that to have, it's part of the defense. But at the end of the day, these things, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the way the world works is, you know, half of it is politics and half of it is law. And so they're going to go on a dual track, which is they're going to try to 
politically influence the people that are decision makers. And what struck me from Yamana Gabraab's uh, press conference was that he seemed, you know, unusually uh, confident that this is not going to go beyond a recommendation of the uh, Commission of Inquiry. On the other hand, you know, in the past, the government uh, of Eritrea has, to say the least, overstated the number of countries that it, that are its allies or its friends. I, I fully expect uh, the government to create, yes, uh, one more time, and the, the UN is coming after us. They never wanted us to be an independent country to begin with, and this is just a continuation of their effort to compromise our sovereignty and right. to interfere in our in our uh, in our internal affairs the crimes of the Eritrean government are well documented they've been perpetrated on the Eritrean people for decades now despite this information many Eritreans even though they may support the findings of the UN commission one of the biggest fears that you hear at least voiced in many circles is that the findings or situations like this in the international media will compromise the sovereignty of uh, Eritrea, and the government exploits that fear. Uh, they also feel, of, like I mentioned earlier, that these are politically motivated because they will say or present arguments that the Ethiopian government was not uh, accused of any crimes, even though land was taken from Eritrea. So how can the Eritrean opposition ensure these findings do not compromise the sovereignty? Is that a, a sort of a fear that's exploited in the population because the assumption is that there's going to be some foreign intervention and that's how the government tries to maintain the status quo? You know, how should that message sort of be distributed by the Eritrean opposition to say that the, these findings are one aspect of things and the sovereignty of the nation is a different issue. Sure, sure. Well, okay, so that's a, that's a really tough question, and thank God I'm not a politician, that I don't have to deal with this <laughs> headache. But <laughs> so here's the thing. Notwithstanding all the protests from those who support the government, the Commission of Inquiry called for faithful implementation of the Eritrea, 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 Ethiopia Boundary Commission ruling in its first report, and then it called for it again in this report. And so the least that the Eritrean opposition can do is very forcefully, unambiguously say, yes, we too support the faithful implementation of the Eritrea-Ethiopia boundary commission ruling. Uh, none of this, you know, clever by half, 10 point, 11 point, 17 point uh, 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 proposals by Ethiopia. You just flat out say, Yes, we are for the faithful implementation of the EBC as part of international law. Everybody accepts, accepts this, even a body that was instituted to find crimes against humanity, against the government of Eritrea, came and said Ethiopia should abide by the Boundary Commission ruling, period, the end, fini. There shouldn't be any qualifiers to that. Now, because every nation state whose identity is not based on a shared ethne, you know, like Japan or a shared civilization like China, has to create its own ideals of what constitutes being a, a nation of that state. Right. That's why states are based on an imagined identity. You know, for example, the United States does not base its national identity on a unique ethne, but that is the ideal of the democratic republic, the longest democracy, you know that it's a democratic laboratory, that it has exceptionalism. And the PSDJ, like all nationalistic movements, has been quite successful in arguing that the admission into Eritreanism, into that club, includes recognition that the EPLF, uh, now PSDJ, is the vanguard, the custodian of Eritreanism, and it, it will then define what we value and what we don't value. And topping that list is self-reliance. And self-reliance means no parceling of Eritrean land or people, not to democracy and not to occupiers. So it has, it, has, it has done this narrative that is quite compelling, and we don't have a counter narrative in the opposition other than to say, okay, that was a three-part deal, Mr. PFDJ, 
And that three-part deal, treating the citizen as an individual with dignity, was part of that deal. You broke that, that bond. You broke that deal. And therefore, we reserve the right to question how you define Eritreanism. And so, mm-hmm. like in, within the Eritrean opposition, there is, uh, I regret to say, almost a, teenage, a, teenage, a teenager-like rebellion to reject even stuff that should be accepted, such as the, the ruling of the Eritrea Ethiopia Boundary Commission. That should not be open to discussion. It should be like, yes, Ethiopia should. Yeah. yeah. It's been decades. There's been a lot of information about the Eritrean government. We've, many people have witnessed the atrocities that go on. And at every turn, there is a momentum of voices that get, oh, this is the end. This is going to, um, this is going to shut it all down. This is, it's, we are at the end. It's, he's got, they've got two more years. They've got 10 more years. Right. At, at every, right. every turn, we hear that. So right. uh, just to kind of really uh, bring that out to light, what does this really mean, you know, for the world community? Do you think the world community and the Eritrean opposition can force the current regime to step down based on these? report because you know that's a lot of um, misconceptions that are around that it's an immediate situation that things like this will now that the world knows that crimes against humanity are perpetrated by the Eritrean government it's it's over (laughs) Uh, just wanted to get your take on that no 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 short answer is no (laughs) the reason for there's two reasons for that one is it's extremely difficult to overthrow government, any government. It's extremely difficult because the one thing that authoritarian governments are good at is how to stay in power. Who do, who is it they have to bribe? Who is it they have to threaten? Who is it they have to intimidate to stay in power? All this does actually is it's a moral argument. What we have now is a moral argument where we in the opposition get or uh, the world to define the government of Isaiah Safworki with one more comma. The government of Isaiah Safworki, comma, which has been accused of crimes against humanity, comma, and then you go on. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really a, a moral argument. And the hard work is to answer the question of the therefore. Well, what does that mean? Therefore, what are we supposed to do? Well, it's it's the same thing, just like uh, there are many uh, within the Eritrean opposition who have been predicting the demise of the government of Eritrea uh, South for uh, over a decade now. Right. Also, within the, the the PFDJ, there have been people who have been predicting the demise and the end of the Eritrean opposition. Doesn't exist. It never existed. It's capable of of not doing anything. But yet, most of their energy from their very meager resource is is spent on fighting the Eritrean opposition. So the wise thing to do, the smart thing to do, would have been to try to say, okay, you're Eritreans, we're Eritreans, we have a disagreement on how the government should be ruled, and let's argue about the mechanism for us to sell our vision to the Eritrean people. And that's called a democracy, where... Yeah. Like Yamane Gebrahab said uh, at his press release uh, that, uh, you know, when, when, when Isaiah Safurke is not too busy stopping at traffic lights that don't work, then he has the support of, you know, 99%. Well, these are all manufactured numbers. I mean, he may truly believe that, but it hasn't been documented. And whenever you ask them to document it, they say, well, that's because the Eritrean opposition doesn't exist. Or, you know, when he came to New York, he had so many people. He's like a celebrity. But that's not how you decide whether your vision is shared by the people. You right. put it to the test. You say, this is our vision. This is the vision. You don't even get to define what the vision of the opposition is. You let them define it. And then the people accept or reject it. So this, to me, to answer your question, to, full, to complete that circle, is one more moral argument that we're making that this government is not fit to lead. And that people have to understand that it's a long haul. It's a long process. This is one step towards solidifying the fact, like you said, that this government is 
not fit to lead, but to understand that there's more work to be done, that there is a, a continuation of this process. Oh, it's a, it's a, exactly. It's a long, long process. And this is the part that, uh, that frustrates me about our Eritrean opposition is there are people who get all excited and get hyperactive. And then when things don't change tomorrow, then they fall off and they say, oh, the opposition is useless. Well, based on what? Based on a timeline you have set for yourself that things should change in 10 minutes? Right. No, it takes a long time. To, to bring about change because it took a long time to create the system we have in Eritrea. It didn't come overnight. That's why the Commission of Inquiries investigation go all the way back to 1991. They said we have to go all the way back to 1991 because we wanted to see how the system was created, how it was consolidated, and how it was being maintained. And it's a long process. I mean, if you compare Eritrea in 1991 with Eritrea in 2016, essentially it's more autocratic, it's, it's more authoritarian, and that was an incremental steps that were taken. So to reverse these steps, in my view anyway, because I'm not a revolutionary, is incremental. The other fear of, that is out there, of course, is that uh, reports like this may even make the government more dictatorial, more more crackdowns. Do you think that would happen or could happen? They may, like you said, you know, he sounded very confident in his uh, rebuttal, uh, Yamane, and um, they may take the, or at least, at least appear to feel like this is the worst that can happen, that it's going to stop right here. This is the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, and they're going to go rampant and even be more um, authoritarian, more dictatorial. Uh, is that a possibility? How I think about it is this, like, you know, we, the Eritrean people, are not even the constituency that they, the government of Eritrea is to win over. So if you, if you look at the list of hyper activities over the past you know, for three, four years, claiming that they're drafting a new constitution, that they're joining this convention and that convention, that they have drafted new uh, civil uh, and criminal codes and penal codes. All of that is because their constituency is really Europe. It's not the Eritrean people. It's not the United States. It's not the UN. It's Europe. That's really where the where where all the changes are being made to accommodate European politicians. And, and there's a comical description of it in, in the uh, comical, you know, it's tragic, but comical, in the Commission of Inquiry report where they, if you recall, had made four changes to the, uh, to the uh, civil code, the civil procedure code, and the penal code. And then the, the ambassador, the Eritrean ambassador to the UN is all excited about this and he sends it to the Commission of Inquiry and say, here, you know, look at us, we're making progress. So like the, but the, the, the papers are all jumbled. They, they make references to a constitution that doesn't exist. They make reference to a, to a transitional assembly that doesn't exist. And then the, the commissioner, the, ask the ambassador, all right, great, okay, I see all these documents, they're all over the Internet, but are they in effect? Are they in force right now? And he asked that question repeatedly, and the ambassador does not reply, because he doesn't know. <laughs> because how, how these things are supposed to happen is a body debates them, adapts them, and they're published in the Eritrean Gazette. Well, these are not even published in the Eritrean Gazette. They just wrote them to appease Europe. So we're not even players, the, the <laughs> Eritrean people. <laughs> so whether, whether they become more brutal, less brutal, is only to the extent that they are trying to appease Europe, not us. You know, we're just uh, uh, props, basically. So that's what, the, that's what the sad thing about this is. You know, if you have... The, the Eritrean government inviting 
the, the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights to Semben, to the prison Semben, and say, hey, take a look at this. We have a, a real prison, but it's not what they tell you. People don't disappear. They actually get sentenced, and they're so, so would they ever do this if an Eritrean asked this? No. Mm-hmm. So Eritreans uh, mm-hmm. are asking, where, where is my family member? And they don't tell them yet. For years. They are doing yeah. everything they can to uh, to win over the European politicians. And to some degree, they are having some success because, unfortunately, Europeans' expectations of Africa and African leaders are so little that any teeny baby steps that you take, they applaud you. Well, that's that's the sad reality of our of yeah. our Eritrea in 2016. Uh, the, you know, some UN and international bodies are reluctant to assist in creating conditions to help oust uh, dictatorial regimes, dictators, uh, by assisting the local opposition, or even even if it's from a peripheral, you know, not necessarily any direct involvement, but but even in justification. Uh, due to, you know, some past experiences, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, Hussein, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, Mubarak in Egypt, and Saleh in Yemen, everybody has seen the chaos that ensues from these situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, between the human and infrastructure devastation, mm-hmm. the thousands of refugees that flee the conflict areas, and uh, so many international and national groups Fear the descent into chaos. That's a big concern mm-hmm. and fear, you know, among everyone, both internally in Eritrean communities and internationally. How uh, and and right now, because of this crisis of uh, of the refugee situation in Europe, you know, the European Union is trying to negotiate with Bashar in Syria and Isaias in Eritrea. How does the Eritrean community explain or? to the world community that the situation is different in Eritrea, or is it different in Eritrea? How Mm -hmm. do we still go forward without, um, you know, being crippled by that fear that this is, you know, that the the devil you know is better than, you know, the unknown. The unknown is what Mm -hmm. scares a lot of people in in, Mm -hmm. in many different situations, uh, Mm -hmm. even though the situation is really dire and problematic in Eritrea, that the unknown, because of how the conditions have been created, there's mm-hmm. a real deep fear of what that unknown means. What happens if this regime goes? What will happen to Eritrea? And uh, mm-hmm. that's, I think that's a very big fear. How do you, how do the how does the opposition try and assuage that fear? Sort of. Sure. Uh, well, that's that's an excellent question, and it's a very valid concern. Uh, so I would say two things. Uh, one are things that we in the opposition, by we I mean I'm I'm not in any organized opposition, but let's say let's say generally we in the opposition should do both in terms of changing ourselves and uh, in terms of uh educating uh, those who feel that way. So you, you you gave the example of Iraq and Libya and Yemen and Egypt. But here's the key difference. There was a period when all those tyrants were ruling, or were were lording over these countries. A normal citizen who wants nothing to do with the state, and wants nothing to do with politics, just wants to make a living and support his family, had some breathing space to do so as long as he stayed away from politics. In Eritrea, the state is everywhere. Uh, following compulsory K to twelve education, which is great, it's a sign of civilization all over the world. There is no transition without a break to go into compulsory military service. So the state has now taken over the citizen from 11th grade. And how old is he when he's 11th grade? Well, 18. In some cases, the kids kids who advance uh, grades, they are 16. Uh, and this was reported in a, in a table, and then in a, in a report that the SOA commander sent to the to the president's office, and then they say, "Oh, there is no, there is no child conscription in Eritrea." Well, if a kid is advancing and he graduates from high school at 15, 16, they don't say, "Well, wait till you get 18 and come back to us." So, 
the state is essentially t- i have uh, i have attended and spoken at graduation ceremonies where kids are just thrilled they're breaking the bonds of school and now they can go and be adults and that doesn't exist in Eritrea. So the the state is suffocating you and your entire family via all its incidents. If you're not at school, at their school, you're at their military training. If you're not at their military training, you're in their military service. If you're not in their military service, you're doing manual labor for them or you're doing civil service for them. If you're not in any one of these places, you're in one of their jails. And so the, the difference here is that the degree is much more extreme in that an average person who wants nothing to do with politics, doesn't care who's governing the country, cannot have a normal life. And so it's a dehumanizing experience when all the choices are removed from you. And this is what they meant by uh, modern slavery, which, uh, you know, years ago, uh, a, 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 our, our colleague spoke about that, about the slavery. And if you remember an article, uh, a series of articles that were written, uh, uh, if yes, you, yes. right. And, you know, he was way ahead of his time, I think now, because we, when we saw that, we said, oh my God, that's an exaggeration. Uh, why are you saying that? And now when, when we look at it, we say, yes, that is exactly what it is. It's modern slavery. So, so that's one. It's to explain to people, that this, the, the severity is much more extreme, that Eritreans are not just going to somewhere, they're running away from somewhere. Yeah. So, and that's what, like, you know, Dan Connell observed after he visited refugee camps that people are escaping a culture of violence. So right. they're not just going out there to make a better living for themselves. It's just a violence everywhere you go in Eritrea. So that's 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 one, which essentially, like I, I forgot to mention his name, Ad Hanum. It was Ad Hanum Gavramariam who said the word The second thing that we can do is okay. Now that we have described how terrible the government of Eritrea is, is even by the standards of other authoritarian, we have to we in the opposition have to present the, an attractive alternative, and that's where we have. Uh, failed, or a better way would be to say, where we haven't succeeded so far is in presenting an attractive alternative to say, okay, to answer that question of the devil you know, well, here's the devil you know, and we have to present them, not necessarily an angel, but a human (laughs) Uh, who who is able to govern and who is going to ensure that there's going to be a stable country. And, and that's, I think, where the opposition is right now working. It's uh, a lot of people get frustrated because change is not fast enough within the opposition. Well, change is never fast. And if it's fast, it's never going to last. So I'm encouraged right now with the Eritrean opposition. I know people don't see it. But there's a movement afoot to recognize, okay, we can't continue the way we are. And they, they will be changed in that regard. And the voices are are getting louder before there was so much repression and fear that very few, you know, the opposition voices or the voices that sounded the alarm were very, you know, small groups of the Eritrean community and or small factions of the Eritrean community. And that voice is getting louder and louder. And that is where the work of the opposition needs to focus, that the alternative May, even if it's not uh, uh, completely laid out and 100% uh, clear, that even there mm-hmm. are multiple versions. Like you said, the point is to be able to present the argument that this way of governing, that is what you need to be able to present to the right. people. So there is a lot of work to do, like you said, but uh, the voices are... Um, are growing louder, and there is more justification now from the international community, uh, you know, from situations like this report that are mm-hmm. going to be able to really support, support support those voices. Part of the problem was that there was, you know, no independent media in Eritrea that are, uh, you know, there's all this argument about the 
news is from people who are, you know, Eritrean opposition that may be disgruntled. The argument that at least the government presents um, right. that there is no, it's not uh, factual information because, of course, there's very little, there is no media, there is no free media, there is no free voice in Eritrea. Uh, it right. is, you know, being from uh, people in the diaspora, uh, but I, um, it's very heartening to hear that you are encouraged, which is a very important thing to feel because it's going to be a long haul, that mm-hmm. it's not uh, an overnight situation and that things are not going to be solved easily, but that people should really think about um, continuing um, the struggle. Yes. Yeah. So what, because what's the alternative? The alternative is you drop out and you pretend you're not Eritrean, or this is a remote country that doesn't concern you, or 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 you just live in an ambivalent world where you your you know, your whole day is on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand. And what this report does is, regardless of what you think of the good that the government has done, there is nothing to justify the systematic widespread brutality that is inflicted on your own brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. And therefore, for you to be able to influence that, to say, stop, you cannot defer it until the land is demarcated. You can't defer it until A or B or C because authoritarian governments are very good at creating new facts on the ground to get you to defer your decision, to say, okay, I'll wait until this. That was the whole thing about the so-called uh, article, is if you just say, I'm, I'm just going to wait, I'm just going to wait, I'm just going to wait, and you defer and you defer and you defer your moral outrage, by the time you're morally outraged, it's too late. You're not in a position to influence anything. So it is a clear line at this point. There is no... Like you said, it's it's almost like the border issue. It's like that. There is, at this point, you have no real justification for that support, or to right. or at least to to blindly support uh, right. what the government is doing in Eritrea. Uh, right. Salah, thank you so much. This was uh, very informative. I appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. Thank you very much for your insight. I'm sure a lot of people will be very much more informed, uh, hope, hopefully, and shed, you know, some of the light has been shed uh, on some the events of this uh, past week and the report findings of the Commission of Inquiry on Eritrea. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I thank you for giving people the opportunity to explain what exactly happened, is it happening. I want to invite all Eritreans to actually read the report. It's only 90 pages compared to the 500 from last year. And uh, uh, we Eritreans uh, sometimes get a little too impatient. We don't read entire reports and we jump to the conclusions. And I just want people to have an informed opinion. One of the things that the Commission of Inquiry said when it got 40,000 protests from Eritreans is, you know, it used a statistical sampling of 5% from the 40,000, and it said, okay, I'm going to call the 5% sample, and it called every single 5% from the overall 40,000. And there were just people making wild accusations against it, and the commission concluded they have not read it. They have just been told what it says, but they haven't read it. And I invite everyone, whether they support the government or they oppose the government, to read. Read the report is in the website of the Human Rights Council. And uh, read especially the map that shows the 77 prisons. Look at it. And then you can have an informed debate and discussion. And I, I really thank you for this opportunity. That, that And that is excellent advice. And uh, like you said, people can search for it online. Um, they can it's in the, people, you know. yeah, it's what is in the, the best the, way to uh, search for it? It's, a, it's in the OHCHR.org website and uh, all Eritrean websites, uh, Awate and your own website, Asenna as Marina, really should link to it uh, so that people can read it 
and and those who are good at creating summaries should create summaries for people to read. Uh, but it is posted in the website of the, the OHCHR, the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, COI Eritrea. It, 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 if you just Google it, you you'll find. It. Thank you again, uh, Salah, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vice President, distinguished members of the Human Rights Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon and thank you all very much for the opportunity to present to the Human Rights Council the findings of the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in Eritrea. I'm joined on the podium by my fellow commissioners, Sheila B. Kitharuth and Victor Denkwa. We presented our first report to you 12 months ago, documenting a multitude of human rights violations in Eritrea. The Human Rights Council unanimously approved, without a vote, a resolution and mandated the Commission to determine whether these violations might amount to crimes against humanity and to address the issue of accountability. The Commission has concluded that Eritrean officials have committed crimes against humanity. The crimes of enslavement, imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture, persecution, rape, murder and other inhumane acts have been committed as part of a widespread and systematic campaign against the civilian population since 1991. The aim of the campaign has been to maintain control over the population and perpetuate the leadership's rule in Eritrea. I want to focus on some of the crimes the Commission documented. With regard to the crime of enslavement, the Commission found that the violations relating to Eritrea's military slash national service programs include their arbitrary and indefinite duration, often for years, beyond the 18 months set out in the law, the use of conscripts as forced labour, including manual labour, the inhumane conditions of service, the rape and torture often associated with service, and the devastating impact of these programs on family life and freedom of choice. Despite promises to the contrary, the Eritrean government has taken no steps to address any of the problems associated with its military and national service programs. For these reasons, we have concluded that Eritrean officials have committed the crime of enslavement. The use of arbitrary detention has been and remains routine across Eritrea. It is not only reserved for critics of the government. Indeed, many of the witnesses to whom we spoke described arrest and lengthy detention for reasons difficult to discern or categorize. The vast majority of those detained said that they had not been brought before a judge, tried or involved in any form of judicial proceeding. In addition, the government very rarely informs family members or judicial authorities about detentions, and most detainees described widespread torture. These acts are ongoing and constitute crimes against humanity. The Commission has also documented various acts of sexual and gender-based violence. In military training camps and in the army, some young women are used as slaves to perform domestic duties and are also raped. Rape is also committed in detention facilities by officials and guards, not only against a significant number of women, but also against men. While some forms of torture are used against both men and women, other forms are gender specific, such as the beating of pregnant women, in military training camps or in the army to induce abortion. <coughs> Instances of sexual violence against men were also documented by the Commission, including sexual torture done intentionally to ensure these men are no longer able to reproduce. The Commission found that the crimes it documented have been committed primarily, directly or indirectly 
by state and ruling party officials, military commanders and members of the National Security Office. The Commission has identified alleged perpetrators and has compiled files on those individuals to assist future accountability mechanisms. The Commission has concluded that the government of Eritrea has neither the political will nor the institutional capacity to prosecute the crimes we have documented. We therefore recommend that the UN Security Council refer the situation in Eritrea to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and that the African Union establish an accountability mechanism. The Commission has also asked member states to prosecute or extradite suspects on their territories and that the Security Council impose travel bans and freeze the assets of individuals suspected of crimes against humanity. I would like to highlight some of the recommendations to the Human Rights Council. Renew the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Eritrea and provide the mandate holder with additional human and financial resources. Keep the situation in Eritrea on its agenda and invite the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to report periodically on the situation of human rights. Support the establishment of a structure by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights with a protection and promotion mandate in particular to ensure accountability for the crimes against humanity set out in our report. We are aware that several visitors to Eritrea as well as some diplomats based in Asmara have recently painted a more favourable picture of Eritrea. We have been mandated by the Human Rights Council to investigate systematic, widespread and gross human rights violations that generally take place in isolated locations and behind closed doors, in places where casual visitors, journalists and diplomats do not have access. The Commission would have wished to visit the country and un have unhindered access to sites and locations but was denied such a visit by the government of Eritrea. Our findings are based on detailed statements and information from over 833 individuals in over 13 countries, the overwhelming majority of whom have personally suffered human rights violations in Eritrea. We have been able substantially to corroborate the information provided by these witnesses. We also selected and contacted a sample of 500 individuals who wrote to us saying that our first report was inaccurate and, read and, and further we read with care the written submissions of thousands more. In our report we have acknowledged some signs of increased engagement from Eritrea with the international community including with OHCHR but we have not noted any substantial change with regard to the human rights situation there. Where is the rule of law in Eritrea? The rule of law must be paramount in any country. The government and its agents must be subject to the law. People who have their rights abused must have an avenue to raise their grievances. And when they do, they should not be arrested and thrown into prison. Rather, they should be heard by a properly constituted independent court, which is staffed by professional judges who are also not frightened of being arrested. So long as there is no constitution, so long as there is no parliament where you can debate national questions, so long as there is an abusive national service which is unending, so long as there is no free press, so long as there are no civil society organisations apart from government appointed ones, so long as people live in fear and are controlled by the state, there will be no full enjoyment of all human rights and no real progress for the Eritrean people. The preamble of the ICC statute states that crimes that shock the conscience of humanity, such as those that we have documented in our report, threaten the peace, security and well-being of the world and therefore must not go unpunished. We need collectively to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice, not only for the sake of the countless number of Eritrean victims, but to demonstrate that such behaviour is simply unacceptable anywhere in the world today. I thank you very much Mr. Smith for this presentation.
and as is the practice in our discussions, we shall start by.